to the woman, not surely you. It says to me, T me T T. You know, I I'm not really sure. Um, you shall die. It's it's a combination of three words that make one word, and I don't know if it's a singular or a plural. If it said you know, you, in the singular or plural, I could read that because it's a combination of the three words I don't know. So I can look that up and find out. Anyway, that's just a curiosity. I have no idea one way or another. But if he is going to the woman to say that in the singular, then he's causing more confusion. And then he comes out with something that's true. And he says that God knows that on the day that you do it, you will be like God knowing good and evil. And that is true. So he's mixing in at least half-truths, and he's also being cunning in the way that he's doing that, okay? Yes. Those are the best kinds of lies that have half-truths. Yes. Those, uh, that's, yes, that's correct. Right. It's tempting her in the sense that she could be like God and know good and evil. Well, yeah. and th that is a valid sermon that I've heard. I've heard it a couple times where there are three points that they're being tempted on. One is the lust of the eyes. One is the, uh, the, the appetite of the flesh. And the third is the pride of being like God. So there are three things. And if you go to Matthew, the temptation of Jesus in Matthew, Satan uses exactly the same three types of temptation against God to Jesus. Exactly the three things. He says, he goes, shall I uh, make bread out of these stones? Okay, that's the, the, the temptation of the mouth. And then he offers him all the kingdoms of the world. And then he says, um, if you bow down, I will give you all this authority. Anyway, uh, it, the three of them. Oh, throw yourself off and, and uh, the angels will catch you. So he has all three. The pride, he's got the, uh, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh or whatever I just said. Anyway, but they, are, they do make a parallel. Okay, so that's very interesting. As I said, all of these things that we see in here, everything in here points to Christ. We failed, he prevailed, okay? The woman came out of the man, the bride came out of Christ, okay, the, which is the church. So everything that's going on here does have a fulfillment in Christ at some point. So it's, it's important to look at these things to understand why all these little nuances. But as I said, that one particular thing, you will not surely die. I'll have to see if that's in the plural or not, and I just don't know that right now. Anyway, um, so let me go ahead and read uh, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wiser, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. Okay, so those are the three temptations. Same thing as Jesus. She failed. She ate. Okay, and then what did she do? She took of the fruit and ate. Okay, but finish the verse. Oh. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Okay, now I could see, and like I said, this just popped into my mind, this thing about being said to the woman, okay? I could see Adam being told by God, don't eat this thing, uh -huh. or you're going to die. And then he's saying, well, we can't eat of that because you're going to die. Then the devil going to the woman, if it's singular, and I don't know this and I'll have to check it out, but if it's singular... He says, you're not going to die. He sees she doesn't die. Now he says, well, she didn't die, so I can, you know. You see what I'm saying? I don't know. And that, that would be kind of an interesting thing to find out here when I get home. Do you think, Charlie, for sure, that when she handed this to, to him to eat it, that he knew that it was from that tree? Oh, absolutely. So you don't think that she was... She was um, no, I, 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 you know, we know the difference between an apple and a mango now, and this was its own tree with its own fruit. Yeah, I, I, am, I am sure that they both knew. There, I, I have no doubt in my mind that they... Who, Adam? Oh, I see what you're saying is that her giving... No, I wouldn't think so. I would think that, I would think that they are both fully aware of what's going on. Anyway, one of the things that happened here is Adam is the one that's in charge. He's the one that's been given the mandate. He's been the one that's been given control over the family, and he failed. And, you know, this is a picture of us as husbands failing in our marriages, failing in our parental responsibilities. And it goes through the whole Bible. I'm not saying us here right now. I'm talking about in human history. David failed. You know, throughout the Bible, people are failing. Where he failed, though, 
Christ prevailed. Okay, and he will never let us down the way that Adam let down Eve. Anyway, and some people say, well, Adam was standing right there and he saw her doing this and, you know, he didn't say anything. Once again, you're reading something into the Bible that isn't there, but she did eat it. And whether she brought it to him later or whether he was standing there, he watched her to see if she'd die and she didn't. You know, anyway, but what I asked last week and you answered correctly is, that before I say that, let me read what it says here. It, this, is, this is the commentary from 3-4 in um, uh, this particular Bible. The couple did not immediately die physically. Okay? By God's grace, their death was postponed till a later time. Okay? God said to him, on the day that you eat of this, you will surely die. Okay? It, it's spiritually. That's right. What I'm saying is that this guy here is saying, well, God was graceful and allowed him to live. No, he said, you will surely die. No, it, it, no, it, it, that's what I'm saying. He, this guy here is not using his sense. God either told the truth or there's an error in here or God lied. I mean, that, that, that's all there is to it. And this guy is trying to say, well, they didn't really die. Well, yes, they did. As he said last week, they died spiritually. God didn't lie. Now, one book called the Book of Jubilees, which is uh, it's a Hebrew book that goes way back, and it's like a complementary to, to Genesis. The commentary was that Adam lived 930 years, okay, 70 years short of 1,000 years, which is uh, less than a day in God's economy. Uh, in Psalm 90, verse 4, it says, a day to the Lord is like 1,000 years, and 1,000 years is like a day. So the Jewish people... The, 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 the person that wrote that particular commentary said that God was saying that you would die on the day that you eat of this fruit. And because one day to the Lord is like a thousand years, he did die on that day. You see what I'm saying? Because he lived 930 years, not a full thousand years. Okay? So that was his way of getting around this. But that's not what the Bible's speaking of. The Bible is speaking of spiritual death. From this point, from the point that we're reading right now, all the way until the end of the Bible... It is speaking that we are born dead spiritually. We are in Adam. Let's see if we can go real quickly. Let's see if we can find this. Um, I, I think it's probably Romans 5. I may be wrong, and if I'm wrong, then we'll just go back to Genesis and keep reading. But um, Romans 5, it says here, um, <coughs> it is, Romans 5, it says, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. I'm in Romans 5.12. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him to come, which is Jesus. Jesus is the type of Adam. All right. But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, Adam, for judgment which came from the one offense, the fall, uh, resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one's, one man's offense, meaning the fall, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Christ Jesus. Okay? All are condemned because of what Adam did. We are all in Adam. And I mentioned that before. We're in Adam three ways. We're in there legally, what Paul is talking about right there, positionally, or I'm sorry, uh, seminally, and um, uh, legally, seminally, and um, what's the other one when you're not born but you could be born? Uh, legally, uh, it begins with a P. Come on. What's that? Potentially. potentially thank you. I, wow. Legally, potentially, and seminally, we are all in Adam. And that's why John in uh, the 18th verse of the third chapter says, um, let me read it to you. It says, um, uh, he who believes in the Son is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. We are legally, potentially, and seminally in Adam from the moment that he was created and the moment he fell, we are all condemned in Adam, okay? And so in Romans 5, Paul is saying that death came through one man, okay? And we all died because of that. But to say that it was a physical death when God just got done saying that you will die on the day that you eat of it, and then they didn't die, 
is to do an injustice to what God had said to Adam. They did die. They died spiritually. And they remained spiritually dead, and all people are dead until they come to Jesus Christ. And that's why I say there's churches all over the world full of what? Dead people. Because they have never come to Jesus Christ. They sit in church every week thinking that they're fine. And until you come to Christ, you're spiritually dead. And your sin remains on you. So, uh, anyway, that's, that's the way that goes. Let's go to Galatians 3 real quick. There's probably a good verse in there to, to uh, fit that. Let me see. 3. Uh, 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 uh. As a matter of fact, we're going to go to Acts 2 also, just because something popped into my head. This all pertains to the same thing. But Galatians 3, it says here, um, uh, I'll tell you what, we're not going to read 3 yet. Uh, keep Galatians 3, and I, we will read that in a few minutes, because as I said, we're going to get somewhere here, and hopefully we'll get to it today. But that will, that will pertain, and then we'll go to Acts 2 and Galatians 3 at the same time. And we should, get, we should be able to get there today. So anyway, um, verse... Uh, where were we? Verse 7. Okay? Go ahead. Somebody read 7. We're, we're back in Genesis. Yeah, we're, gonna, we're going to read Galatians 3 and Acts 2, but I want to get to another point before we get ahead of ourselves. Go ahead. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Okay, their eyes are opened. They now have the knowledge of good and evil. And the devil didn't lie in that particular case. You will become like God knowing good and evil. All right, everything else was either cunningly uh, deceitful or it was an outright lie, just depending on that second one, which I'm not sure of right now. But the third one was true. They will become like God knowing good and evil. And they did. But the fact is that when they became like God, knowing good and evil, they realized that what they had done was evil and that they were standing naked, bare in the presence of God. Now, throughout the Bible, there is a term, um, in the face of God. We are in the presence of God. And the bread of the presence in the uh, Ark of the Covenant is called the bread of faces. Okay? God's presence, his face is there. And that's why if you go to Numbers, I believe it's 6. Let me go there real quickly and I'll read this. Hang on, number six, Leviticus numbers, I believe it's number six. And you've all heard this a million times. If you ever watch John Hagee, who I do not like, he says it all the time. But the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So the face of the Lord being turned towards you is a blessing, all right? But it also can be a curse if you are naked in the presence of the Lord. Okay, if you are laid bare before him without a covering, then he sees everything. And we, we stand utterly condemned in the presence of God. So this is what's coming. They've realized that we are naked. And what, that, what the significance of that is, I've never read any commentaries. Has anybody read, you know, the significance of being naked? I mean, you know, they were naked and now they're not. And why is that shameful? But it does mention in the book of Revelation, um, where is that? Um, uh, it's probably Revelation 3. And it, it's calling into account or uh, remembrance the account of Genesis that we just, this, this verse we're reading right now. It says, let me see if I can find this. It says, um, uh, uh, real quickly, the garments of white and... Um, Behold, he says, you are, I know your works. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. That's verse 318 of Revelation. So he's calling into remembrance what we're reading right now. It's like bookends. This is happening here. This is being exposed here and you need to repent and you need to cover the shame of your nakedness. He's saying that you are just as naked now as Adam was back in the garden, okay? Um, where are we? Um, uh, the, the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made them coverings. So now they are doing what? what let's talk about the fig leaves. What are they doing here? Give me some, some thoughts on the fig leaves. They're making works. Okay, works. That's the first one. They are working, trying to get back into favor with God. That's, that's exactly right. They are making coverings. Okay, fig leaves, are they suitable for a covering? No, no they're totally unsuitable. What's going to happen after they dry out? 
They're going to crinkle and they're going to fall off. Exactly. They're unsuitable. And this is just a picture of everything else that we're going to see at the Tower of Babel and everywhere else. Works, works, works. Anything other than what God has ordained in the Bible is works. And it doesn't matter what religion you go to. If you leave this church and go to any church that preaches works, salvation, it's fig leaves. 